So happy new year to everybody. Uh, we're excited about another edition of our Corgoning uh, Science Webinar. Excited to see 91 participants already. It's fantastic. Um, probably a credit to our two speakers today who I'll introduce in just a second. Also just wanna take a minute to acknowledge uh, Nick Boucher is still helping us today. Um, even though he's, I think, no longer with the Fishery Commission. Is that true, Nick? Yep. Yeah, I just uh, am sort of passing the reins off. So I'm officially a, an MSU employee, as far as I know, at least. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that's true. Um, and Renee Renauer Bova is uh, going to be helping us facilitate from here on out. So um, yeah, hi, everyone. Very good. Um, so I think, I mean, in terms of housekeeping things, Renee, is there anything you wanted to say in terms of um, people are muted essentially when they come in, right? Yep, yeah. everyone comes in muted. Please stay muted unless you are asking a question at the end. And otherwise I can talk about our next month's webinar we have scheduled on February 3rd uh, with Alex. And it'll be about whole lake acoustic telemetry and eDNA to evaluate Cisco restoration in an inland lake. And I'm gonna put that link in the chat here so you can start registering for that. Perfect, thanks. And we had one other sort of uh, advertisement slide to share before we got going with the seminar here. Uh, Aaron Dunlop and Andrew Muir are uh, putting together a symposium at IAGLER that's happening in Toronto this May. Um, you can read the abstract there. They're seeking abstracts. I think, Aaron, if you wanted to pop on, or, or Andrew, is it January 27th for the deadline to submit an abstract? Yep, that's right. Okay. Anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, just the, the conference is in, in May in Toronto, and you can, there's, you should be able to just um, Google, Google it to find uh, the link to submit your abstract. Fantastic. Yeah. Good suggestion to advertise that. Um, all right. Wow. 107. Excellent number of participants. And so I guess any other sort of housekeeping from Renee or Nick's perspective? No. Okay. Well, it is my pleasure then to introduce our two speakers today. And maybe, Jory, you, if you're going first, maybe you could start sharing your screen mm -hmm. while I do that. Um, first, uh, Jory will be speaking. Jory got her bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, uh, in biology with a minor in science and environmental change. Um, I also learned from her that she got a uh, certification in secondary science education. So oh, at one point, she was thinking about being a high school biology teacher, I assume from that. That's something I didn't know we had in common, Joy. I also oh. have a biology degree and did my student teaching way back in Kentucky in the mid 90s. So. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Jory also got her master's at the University of Illinois, working with uh, in ecology, ecology, ethology, and evolution with uh, Dave Wall. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and she joined the Charlevoix Fishery Research Station with Michigan DNR in 1996. So this is her 26th year, which is pretty remarkable. So a lot of experience and wisdom she's going to share with us today. Um, and then uh, when she's done with her part of this talk, uh, she's going to pass the torch to Ben Tershak. Uh, ben got his bachelor's degree from Lake Superior State University uh, in fisheries management, a great undergraduate fisheries program here in Michigan. Got his master's and PhD at the University of Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, in the freshwater sciences group. Both of those were with Harvey Bootsma, Ben, is that right? Yeah. Yep. yep. So, and Ben joined also the Charlevoix Fisheries Research Station with Michigan DNR in 2017. So finished up a little bit before getting his PhD, but uh, was able to finish his PhD a few years later. So uh, with that, they're here to talk to us today about from planktivore to piscivore, rethinking the trophic role of Cisco in the Lake Michigan food web. So thanks very much, you two. 
Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Bo. Appreciate it. So what we're going to be doing is talking to you about the current situation in Lake Michigan, which, which is a bit remarkable, I think, for Cisco. Um, and I am probably most interested in hearing some of the discussion at the end and the feedback from you about what you hear and what you think after we do present this. Um, our title is From Planktivore to Piscivore, Rethinking the Trophic Role of Cisco in the Lake Michigan Food Web. Uh, the picture that's associated with this is actual fish that were caught by people in our office um, in, uh, off the pierhead in Charlevoix. Um, this is a regular occurrence every year in June. Um, it's just these Cisco are creating a tremendous fishing opportunity and I'll be getting into more of the demographics of what Cisco are doing in Lake Michigan throughout the presentation. We wanted to take a moment and acknowledge uh, the many co-authors and collaborators that we've had throughout doing this work. Um, it, it's almost too many to name. Um, we just have an amazing group of, of collaborative um, people that we work with in the Great Lakes and on Cisco in particular. Um, specific names include Harvey Bootsma, Ben Breaker, Chuck Bronte, Bo Bonnell, Randy Claremont, Kevin Donner, Matt Fuchsia, Matt Cornis, Chad LaFaver, Kevin Pangle, Jacques Rinchard, Jason Smith, and Dave Warner. Um, the, and those are the primary contributors to the data that are being presented today. Uh, we'd also like to thank our Creel staff and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Biotechnicians who help with collecting biodata in these large lake-wide surveys, and the many sport and commercial fishers that volunteer samples and participate in agency census programs. Numerous agencies, as I mentioned earlier, I just wanted to take a time to throw the logos up here. And then we're going to spend a brief amount of time, and I'm hoping many in this audience are familiar with Lake Michigan Cisco and the history of Cisco in the Great Lakes, but I thought just in case there's a few that are not, um, we'll do a brief overview of, of what Cisco looked like in Lake Michigan in particular. Um, they are commercially and recreational, um, recreationally and ecologically vital species in the Lake Michigan ecosystem in the past. Um, Prior to and post-European settlement, they were one of the most abundant fish species. They supported vast commercial fisheries and served a variety of ecological functions, um, occupying and utilizing a variety of different habitats and resources in the lake. This is kind of showing you the, the commercial fishery relative to other Great Lakes. So while Lake Michigan was never really on par with Lake Superior, they maybe touched a little bit there in the 1950s, um, it was more similar to those experienced in Lake, Lake Huron. And, um, and then we saw that extra near extirpation of the species um, due to a combination of commercial fishing and sea lamprey. We don't really know to what extent either of those played um, in making that happen and creating that situation but we had near extirpation of the entire species in Lake Michigan and commercial harvest went down to near zero. Since this time, we have had some tremendous large changes in the ecosystem and community um, of Lake Michigan um, and these recovering Cisco are experiencing a much different environment than they would have in the past. Um, most importantly, perhaps, are the recent proliferation of invasive species like alewife, dry-scented mussels, spiny water flea, um, bithotrephes, round goby, um, you name it, um, they're playing a role in what Cisco are doing right now because it has reconstructed the entire ecosystem of Lake Michigan. And in general, we've seen a, redu a reduced productivity, reduced zooplankton abundance, um, and some substantial changes in the available prey fish communities. This is work uh, that we have already published uh, with Claremont et al. Um, and it's in that expansion of Cisco populations in Lake Michigan. I thought it would be nice to put in front of the audience here when that expansion occurred and the extent to which it occurred 
and how well supported it is. So we have the commercial yield of Cisco, recreational harvest of Cisco, survey gillnet Cisco observations, and observations from a Ludington pump storage plant that we monitor um, for uh, prey fish mortalities or fish mortalities that are being brought up into the system. And each of these data sets um, have, have indicated an expansion in observations of Cisco. And in particular, that timeline around 2011 seems to stand out. I don't have a logical explanation for that, but it repeats itself in multiple data sets and 2011 seems to kind of be a key time when that real expansion started to go. Um, and some of these data sets are better or worse at capturing that expansion. So the, the Creel a recreational fishery lagged a little bit that first um, expansion was the, the breaking point was 2016. Cisco are, are now becoming so ubiquitous in Lake Michigan that they've become an expectation in sport fisheries in northeastern Lake Michigan and Grand Traverse Bay. Um, this is a, a map showing a harvest of Cisco in recreational fisheries from 1997 to 2016. And in Grand Traverse Bay in particular, and off of Charlevoix and the Pierhead, um, these are fisheries that people have begun to count on as part of their business. Charter fishers use it. Um, people going out angling anticipate the opportunities to catch Cisco, um, and they're really enjoying it. Another thing you didn't think of when you thought of Cisco, I'm going to guess, until recently. So, we're going to now go into what the generalized into what the talk is about today, which is diets and Cisco. Uh, so we're, I'm just going to give a brief background of what we understand or understood about Cisco diets. And this is something if Dan's on here, I borrowed this from you many, many years ago. I just wanted to make the point that in Lake Superior, Cisco eat invertebrates and zooplankton. And you, know, you can look at the axes on this. Um, they have a size differential, but we're looking at mices, Clodocera are big, um, terrestrial insects play a role. So there's a lot of invertebrates, zooplankton. Um, you don't see fish showing up here. So this is the Lake Superior story in a nutshell. Here's the Lake Ontario story in a nutshell. And this is work that was recently published, published by uh, Gatch et al. Um, and again, you can see that these dietary items that are comprising the major proportion are copepods, daphnia, limnocalinus, and you don't really see fish showing up to a large extent in the diets over in Lake Ontario. With one caveat in this study, I think they evaluated 178 fish for diets and four of them did have fish prey items. And so that's very small. It's 0.2% of the total biomass over there. Uh, but they did find some alewife, rainbow smelt, round goby, and an unidentified centrarchid of some sort. So I, it looks like that's big, but it's not. It's a very tiny little piece, and it's not the, the norm in Lake Ontario by any stretch. So now we have some early hints that things might be a little bit different in Lake Michigan. And this is when we started collaborating with Jacqueline Shard and Matt Fuchsia. Comparing notes, talking about the different observations that we have. So again, these are, di these are diets that we both collected in the two different systems in 2016. And that Lake Ontario situation is mainly copepods, limnocalinus, daphnia, a lot of invertebrates. The Lake Michigan situation, however, had a large dependence on round goby and, um, and then uh, diptera. So that was quite a bit different between the two systems. So we were starting to scratch our heads and say, well, what, what is going on here? One of the early things we did was look at, well, what are the sizes of the fish in these two systems? If, if Lake Michigan are piscivorous, is their growth, are their sizes quite a bit different 
And the answer was yes. On average, Ontario fish in this Rinchard Fuchsia work of uh, 2016 data, their average was around 300 millimeters, whereas in Lake Michigan, we're averaging around 500 millimeters. I thought, well, another way to look at this would be to go look at the GATCH study where they published their length distributions in the diets they collected and compare that against the Breaker et al. publication on Cisco diet analysis in Lake Michigan. And you can see that if you use 400 millimeters as your access point, the GATCH et al. work is all to the left of that, whereas the Lake Michigan work is to a large extent to the right of that. And there's, there's quite, again, a difference in the size distributions of the Cisco in these two systems, Lake Ontario versus Lake Michigan. So now I'm gonna spend a, a greater deal of time talking about this larger study, which is published Ben Baker et al. in Journal of Great Lakes Research 2020. Um, the citation is on the figure here. We looked at 725 di diets um, captured opportunistically over six years from 2014 to 2019. The information I'm going to present here are all of the dots in Northern and Eastern Lake Michigan. Really important for people to understand that this study was not designed initially to be a diet study. We just knew that we were seeing Cisco and it was something special. And we said, you know what, when you get them, keep the stomachs. So it was opportunistic sampling. We just said, put them in the freezer, let's keep the stomachs, let's look at them. And we, get, we started to get a pretty good collection based from that opportunistic sampling. The ports where collections occurred were at Charlevoix in central Lake Michigan, East Grand Traverse Bay, Little Traverse Bay, Northern Lake Michigan, and to a lesser extent in Green Bay. And Green Bay will not be included in future graphs because uh, we had some issue with genetic identification and really low sample size there. So um, East Grand Traverse Bay, you can see, comprised the majority of the samples that we're gonna be uh, presenting to you as, as combined data in, in the near future here. Other super important bullet point is that we were very effective in sampling that spring period because of the recreational fisheries that the pierhead fisheries that show up then and the fact that we're doing spring gillnet surveys. So what we consider spring in future graphs is going to be through the end of June. Summer is the period from June through the end of September and then fall will be considered October through December. And so you can see that our samples are very much centered in the fall and in the spring when we're out doing spawning surveys or when recreational angling is, is accessible um, from the pier heads. And then we have just this little bit that's occurring in the summer period and virtually absent in this graph is anything over winter. So now this is a pretty complex figure and I'm gonna spend a significant amount of time talking about it, but I wanna orient you first. These four diet items, alewife, bithotrephes, diptera, and round goby comprise 94% of the biomass in all diets explored in Lake Michigan from Cisco. So we're eliminating that 6% for simplification. Um, so there are other things that were found in diets, it's just they were very low consequence. So now focusing in on that, we have two axes on the outside of this graph. You have um, the top here, I don't know if you can see my, my pointer or not, is um, the location. So it's Charlevoix, Central Lake Michigan, East Grand Traverse Bay, Little Traverse Bay, and Northern Lake Michigan. And then along the side here are the seasons. So you have that spring season, summer season, and the fall season. And then you have the prey types along the x-axis and they're separated. Another important point here is that we're gonna be looking at mean wet weight and that the axes for all seasons do not match. So when you're looking at say a uh, fall um, bithotrephes and comparing that to a summer bithotrephes, they're actually more similar than they may appear um, if you don't look at the axes uh, scale. All right, so now I'm gonna cover everything up. 
and we're just going to go piece by piece through this graph because it's a lot. So we're going to talk about Charlevoix. In Charlevoix in the spring, we would see round goby and diptera. We didn't have summer collections from this location, so that's the X's. And in the fall, we begin to see a higher prevalence of bithotrephes, and alewife and round goby are contributing more evenly to the diets in this, again, observed diet observations. So then we go to central Lake Michigan collections. And we only have spring samples from here. We do not have summer or fall samples. In the spring samples, we have um, primarily round goby and diptera showing up. When we look at East Grand Traverse Bay, we see again in the spring, those round goby and diptera. During the summer, we see more alewife, but we also see small numbers of bithotrephes and round goby in those diets. And then in the fall, the prevalence of bithotrophies increases and um, alewife and round goby remain present. For Little Traverse Bay, which is the bay north of Charlevoix, going closer to the Mackinac Bridge, we see spring observations that rely on diptera and round goby. Summer observations that begin to rely on bithotrephies more prevalently and continue to see round goby. And then fall observations, which are pretty similar. Again, bithotrephes and round goby. And then in Northern Lake Michigan, more generally, we do not have those spring collections, but we do have some summer and fall collections. And the summer collection, again, shows a higher prevalence towards alewife. Bithotrephes are showing up and round goby. In the fall, it's almost all bithotrephes. So more generally, the diptera and that the, ha the hatches that occur in the spring seem to contribute to diptera uh, creating a prevalent diet item during that time. I believe that's a very really seasonal contribution and that at other times of the year, fish are playing a larger role. I think um, and we'll be providing some data later um, with Ben Tershak and different ways of analyzing diets and, and consumptive inputs. Um, alewife play a larger role in the summer as a generalization and bithotrephes begin showing up in summer and fall where they're contributing as invertebrate species to the diet biomass. Another piece I wanted to emphasize here uh, was when something eats fish, are they eating both fish and invertebrates? Are they eating only invertebrates? Which direction are things going in? So, so the graph you're looking at right here is only utilizing fish gut contents that had prey items present. And what we're looking at is the proportion uh, or the percent of fish that occurred in those diet items. So if something is 0% fish, it means it only had invertebrate items. And the take home message here, and again, you can see the seasonality. We were curious if there was a seasonal effect or not, especially given the diptera and the bithotrephes. But what, what we see here is on an individual basis, if something's eating invertebrates, they tend to be eating invertebrates. There's not a lot in the middle. There's not a lot of mix of invertebrates and fish. It's a lot of fish or invertebrates. And those are the two um, ends in this graph. Now leading into some of that other intriguing evidence comparing with other systems, you know, observed diets have their limitations. So we, this work that we did with Matt Fuchsia and uh, Jacques Rinchard involved looking at fatty acid signatures to identify potential prey resources or trophic niche. And um, in these plots, what I want, or I mean, in this plot, what I want you to take home is that Lake Ontario is quite a diff bit different with fatty acid signatures than Lake Michigan is, that they're isolating from each other. Similar data set, but now put in the context of prey fish species and that the prey fish species are rainbow spelt, round goby, and alewife. 
And the take home message from this graph without breaking it down too far is that in Lake Ontario, there's a lot of overlap with Cisco and the prey fish species complexes. Whereas in Lake Michigan, they're pulling off on their own and um, the prey fish are, are in another space. And so that's another hint that something's different in Lake Michigan than may perhaps be the case in other places. And now Ben is gonna take that and move in some other directions with stable isotope analysis and, and put these things in a broader context um, away from just observed diets. So Ben, I'm passing to you. Yeah, let me just, uh, just get some screens organized here. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody's, everybody's able to see my screen here. Looks good. All right, right on. So <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'm gonna just uh, carry on with that and talk about yet another method for describing um, diets in Lake Michigan. Um, and so that, that is stable carbon and nitrogen isotopes. And so while, while the gut contents have given us a really good idea about uh, the specifics of what Cisco are eating over specific seasons, um, there's, they're, they're prone to certain biases in sampling methodology, particular, particularly when a fish was captured, its location, uh, the method of capture. So when we're only sampling, you know, Cisco in bottom gillnet sets in the spring, uh, we can expect that gut contents, which reflect feeding over a relatively short time period, are going to have, you know, benthic oriented items that might be present, you know, in places where Cisco are in the spring. Um, so the benefit of stable isotopes is that, in, in particular, the stable carbon and nitrogen isotopes is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the benefit that they provide is that they represent feeding over a much longer time period, so months or longer. Um, and, and so with stable isotopes, a consumer really is what it eats um, with, some, with some assumptions. Um, and that process is governed by sort of somatic growth and tissue turnover, uh, which take time. And so that's, that's why these uh, stable isotopes reflect feeding patterns over this larger time scale. <clears throat> now, the trouble with stable isotopes is that um, they're, they're limited in their resolution. So our gut contents provide us with information about exactly what a fish was eating. The stable carbon and nitrogen isotopes are going to give us something that's much more general. Um, but what's great is that with, with sort of modern analytical techniques, we can incorporate um, what we know from gut content analysis into some of our stable isotope analyses. Those things can be rolled into informative priors and Bayesian mixing models and things like that. So we can kind of uh, take advantage of the, the best of both worlds, really. Um, and so with, with that sort of, um, I, I'm going to provide like a, um, just a, a real brief interpretation of what stable isotope data look like and how you might interpret it especially for those who aren't who aren't terribly familiar. So um, so what we're looking at right here is a stabilized tote biplot. We have nitrogen represented on our y-axis, carbon, the carbon isotope ratio is represented on our x-axis. And so with with these isotopes, carbon is a representation of primary energy source. So lighter values oriented more to the left indicate uh, a pelagic or more offshore type energy pathway. Um, this right orientation or heavier carbon is an indicator of more nearshore benthic type uh, energy pathways. Now the nitrogen axis is going to be an indication of trophic level. So higher values are going to indicate an organism that's feeding higher in the food web, higher trophic level, um, or to some extent, the depth that that fish was collected from. So, um, so in this hypothetical example, these are all hypothetical data. Um, we might have several different species represented by the different colors where um, in our offshore food web, we might have some small planktivore that gets a lot of its diet from um, zooplankton. It lives near the surface. We might have a larger planktivore that occupies deeper water or eats larger things. So it occupies a higher trophic level. Uh, and then we ha might have some, some nearshore benthic prey species uh, that gets a lot of its diet from um, benthic invertebrates. And then we might have a hypothetical consumer, say a brown trout in this case, that eats all of these things. And so keeping in mind we, that we know something about how, how these things shift with trophic transfer, um, we can approximate what the diet of this brown trout would be. 
Now, this requires some mental gymnastics when you're just looking at a figure like this, but we can just adjust those prey sources no, using what we know about what we call trophic discrimination factors. So an organism that were to eat nothing but, say, large alewives, this hypothetical prey species right here, um, would that the consumer that eats that would be about 3.4 per mil heavier than the prey source. And it would be about 0.4 per mil heavier with respect to the carbon isotope. So if we were to adjust all of those prey sources using what we know about trophic discrimination factors, we'd end up with a plot that looks more like this. And so where a predator falls between those prey sources should give us a pretty good idea of, of where that predator's diet is coming from, assuming that we have the right prey sources incorporated, which we hope to know from gut content analysis. So in this hypothetical example, this predator probably gets some of its diet from each of these prey sources because it falls directly in the middle. But if you had a, a consumer that fell out to one of the corners, that likely means it gets more of its diet from those other prey sources. Now that's a very non-quantitative way of thinking about it, but this is essentially what a Bayesian mixing model is doing, where we have, you know, a couple, again, a couple hypothetical prey sources um, and in a mixing model, you can incorporate multivariate distributions. For simplicity, I'm going to look at just, you know, univariate distributions here, where we have some pelagic source distributed along this carbon uh, axis and some benthic source distributed along that carbon axis. And then the, the consumer represents a mixture of these two things. And so what a, what a mixing model is doing, a uh, Bayesian mixing model is doing, is essentially figuring out the probability that you get this consumer diet mixture based on some, some uh, mixing of these two distributions. Uh, and so that's what we're, that's what we're using for, for these Bayesian mixing models. So that's um, my very brief primer on, on what we're looking at, but I'm actually going to start presenting some, some non-hypothetical data here. Um, but I'm going to start out talking about Salmonians for one, because most of my research is focused on this in Lake Michigan. I'm actually a relative newcomer to, to Cisco research. Um, and I fell into that primarily because of my experience with stable isotopes. But looking at these five major Salmonians in Lake Michigan, it looks like sort of just a shotgun spattering of points, but we can break that down a bit more. Um, so here I'm fitting Bayesian ellipses to the data, and these Bayesian ellipses represent the 95% sort of, uh, we'll call it a stable isotope niche space. Um, but basically in, encompassing, iteratively fitting ellipses to these data that encompass 95% of those points. Um, and doing that many times, we can start to generate like a median and 95% and confidence region around those data and use those ellipses to then look at similarities. So what we see is that these are highly overlapping, which shouldn't surprise anyone given what we know about um, stable isotope or what we know about the observed diets of these fish in Lake Michigan and that's that they mostly eat alewives. So of course they overlap because they're share, they share a common prey source. Um, what's worth pointing out here is that lake trout, the green, um, fall out a little bit differently. And that tends to be because they, they, um, they occupy a, a space deeper in the water column or more bottom oriented than what some of these other more surface or mid water column oriented fish are. So Chinook salmon, coho salmon, um, steelhead, and brown trout all tend to overlap very strongly with one another, whereas lake trout fall out a little differently. Um, and again, like I said, this shouldn't be surprising to anyone because they share common prey sources, uh, in particular alewives. So if I were to overlay prey sources, taking into account that trophic discrimination factor like we talked about before, so that's these have been adjusted for that, um, I can focus on large alewives and small alewives. And you'll notice that each of these ellipses overlap very strongly with small alewives um, with, with quite a bit of overlap, you know, extending up toward larger alewives as well. Um, so that, you know, sort of paints a picture of where this, this Pisivore community would fall out in, in Northeastern Lake Michigan. Um, but we're here to talk about Cisco, right? So let's, let's do that. So we collected Cisco again, opportunistically from 2017 to 2020 in Lake Michigan, um, prime, well, completely in this northeastern region of the lake. So everywhere from Arcadia, um, you know, through Good Harbor Bay, Grand Traverse Bay, Little Traverse Bay, Beaver Island, and up to Nobbin Way. Um, and, and the Cisco represented a range of sizes, um, 
all of which were large. So even, even the smaller mode of this bimodal distribution is, is probably on par or larger than the, the median or mean um, size of fish collected from Lake Ontario, for instance. With the vast majority of our fish approaching 500 millimeters, which are, um, as I understand, sort of freakish for Cisco populations. Um, so very large fish from this northeastern region. Now I want to go back to our, our predator, um, our, our piscivore community in Lake Michigan. And so we were looking at these all overlaid on top of one another before, but now I'm going to dissolve them into each of their own panels. And I'm going to, I'm going to roll Cisco in here as well. So these are the stabilized top results for Cisco in that same, you know, uh, stabilized top biplot configuration we've been looking at. And I can take that Cisco uh, Bayesian ellipse and overlay it onto each one of these, these piscivores individually. And, and what's remarkable to me, what was really shocking when I looked at this, was the similarity that Cisco has to Chinook salmon here. Um, so Chinook salmon in Lake Michigan are, are nearly obligate ill wife predators. So they're really focused on the one particular species of pelagic prey fish. Um, and each of these species overlaps a lot with Chinook salmon and with Cisco, probably because of their reliance on that one prey source. It was just striking to see this species that we've often, or at least I had historically considered to be planktivorous, you know, extremely isotopically similar, both, um, and I mean, not just where it falls in the biplot, but even the orientation of, and the distribution of those data are almost identical to what we see for Chinook salmon. Uh, it's really, really suggests to me that we're looking at something that is a pelagic piscivore in northeastern Lake Michigan. I should point out here, I've, I've subset these Salmonian data to only northeastern Lake Michigan. So we're comparing the same region from about the same period of time. Now I did the same thing with, with different forage fish or prey fish species, invertivores, if you will, in Lake Michigan. Uh, so here again, Cisco are in this bottom corner and I've overlaid them with each of these species with, with sculpins, not a high degree of overlap, with bloater, another, you know, corrigoni, um, not a high degree of overlap. Round goby, maybe more overlap. That's driven largely by how, how broad the, the isotopic niche area of round goby are rather than Cisco. Um, some overlap with large alewives, almost no overlap with small alewives, which we know are planktivorous, and, and some moderate overlap with rainbow smelt. But comparatively speaking, relative to these, these um, Pacific Salmonians in particular, um, much less overlap. And so we can look at this a little bit differently. So this is the probability that a Cisco collecting in, in Northern Lake Michigan falls inside that isotopic niche area for piscivores or for prey fish. And so what we see for piscivores is that median probability of overlap for all of them, except for lake trout is greater than 75%. Um, very high likelihood that these things occupy a similar trophic role uh, under current ecological conditions. Now compare that to prey fishes in Lake Michigan, and, and the only one that even approaches that is, is round goby, so median values um, approaching 75% there. But um, in general, it really appears that these things are pelagic pisciforms. Now, we can we can take this and, and look at it a little more quantitatively. So we can actually construct Bayesian mixing models that, that calculate um, diet proportions based on what we know about prey sources and taking into account informative priors from diets. And so we know that these, these four groups are, are likely to be primary diet items um, in, in Cisco in, in Northern Lake Michigan. And so running a mixing model with those informative priors, we get something that looks like this. So diet proportion is now on the y-axis, total length is on the x-axis. So as the fish get larger, um, we see a decrease in contribution of invertebrates like bithotrephes, uh, a decrease in contributions of benthic invertebrates like caronomid larvae or diptera. Um, and we see a major increase in the proportion of, of fish in diet, in particular pelagic crayfish, um, alewives in particular. Um, and, and round goby increase in importance as these fish get, you know, very large, but, um, the vast majority of our fish, um, were in this size range and it looks like most of their diet is probably coming from, from alewives based on these mixing model results. So 
you know, taking all of this stuff together, what Jory's presented and what I've shown, there's been sort of this, uh, I don't know if the paradigm shift in how, at least how I've thought about Cisco diets in Lake Michigan. Um, you know, historically, I would have thought of them as planktivores where they got a lot of their diet from calanoid and cyclopoid, you know, uh, and cladocerins and, you know, different uh, predatory or, or native um, species. And, and with some of the diet work that was done early on, it became clear that they were much more piscivorous than what we thought. The breaker work really highlighted the importance of, of some of these benthic energy pathways to Cisco in Lake Michigan, at least seasonally. And the stable isotope results have really shown that the long-term foraging of these uh, fish is probably focused on, on these, you know, more pelagic piscivory, um, you know, a more pelagic piscivory based trophic role. Um, with seasonal contributions from some of these other sources and certainly exhibiting the, the plasticity of this species to eat these other um, prey types. So um, I, I want to point out here the ecological context surrounding, you know, these data, because I think that's really important. Um, so over the period of time that we studied that sort of 2017 to 2020 period we had data for, that's likely reflecting um, feeding that was occurring, you know, from 2016 through, you know, that 2019 kind of time period. And during that time, we saw the abundance of age one alewives uh, really increase in Lake Michigan. And this is based on catch at age modeling um, that we do for our predator prey ratio analysis work. Um, but really, you know, from 2015 through 2019, we saw, uh, you know, over a threefold increase in the abundance of, of age one, these small alewives that seem to be the preferred diet item of, of Cisco based on our stable isotope work. So um, whether, you know, these would continue to be important in Cisco diets under different ecological conditions, I'm not sure. Um, but certainly under current um, conditions, it appears that these are really important to Cisco diets. And then in case any of you um, weren't believing what we were saying, um, I have this video, this short video clip here, um, just demonstrating this, uh, this feeding behavior of pelagic piscivory in, in Lake Michigan, Cisco. Um, so this video was, was um, collected by uh, Yvonne Driebert and Zach Melnick of Inspired Planet Productions. They're working on a documentary in the Great Lakes now called All Too Clear. So I've included their contact information down here. I'd really encourage you all to check it out because, um, I mean, this this footage is is unbelievable, and they have lots more like it of all sorts of different fish behaviors in like, uh, in in the Great Lakes. So um, this this in particular was collected in the connecting channel between Lake Charlevoix and Lake Michigan, so a drowned river mouth and in the main basin, um, in the springtime when alewives were were in this in the channel to spawn, uh, and so you can you can see these Cisco just uh, um, demolishing alewives here. Um, the, the Inspired Planet folks added a cool soundtrack, so I'll see if I can play that for you. It's a short video, so I'll just let it, I'll just let it play to you and stop talking so you can enjoy it without hearing me. So with that, I gotta, I've got to, um, you know, that Cisco are consuming alewives. The preferred prey of salmon is not lost on a lot of recreational angling stakeholder groups that often favor salmon over over native Cisco. Um, and so, so we've been doing our part here to teach younger generations how to keep Cisco in check and help maintain our salmon fishery. So hashtag save a salmon, kill a Cisco. <laughs> 
but for, in, in all in all seriousness here, like uh, as a resident Chinook salmon research biologist, I feel sort of obligated to make a, jo a jab at Cisco. Um, but it really, the you know, I think Jory, Jory mentioned this, and, and in all reality, Cisco now appear to occupy, you know, the role of Chinook salmon in this region and have created a wildly popular and productive fishery at the time when, when Pacific salmon catches have really declined in the region. So, and, and in a lot of ways, they're even more exciting in that they're much more accessible to anglers, um, especially shore anglers and ice anglers um, and, and boat anglers alike. So you don't have to have a great big charter fishing boat to catch these things and, and they provide a really, um, a really neat fishery up here. So, um, I, you know, over the last few years, we've learned a whole lot about, um, about the, the population up here. Um, but I think there's a lot more work to be done and there's a lot more work that's being done. So I want to give a, a shout out to some of the other um, the other PIs that are working on this stuff and, and what they're working on. So um, trying to understand the role of drowned river mouths in this expanding population has been a recent area of focus. So Ralph Tingley and others at USGS have been working on that. Um, and, and some of the work that they're doing includes, you know, diet sampling in periods when we hadn't had samples in the past. So during the winter, um, ice fisheries and things like that. And I don't want to give anything away, but it seems like preliminary um, results are are in alignment with our stable isotope findings. Um, Daryl Hondorp and others at USGS are working on broader scale movement and distribution patterns in, in Northern Lake Michigan. Um, and there's also work being done to understand, you know, uh, dietary responses of Cisco to varying ecological conditions and um, especially over um, through the ontogenic changes in, in the Cisco. So um, that's work by Willie Fetzer and others um, that's ongoing. Um, and, and, I, and I mentioned Lake Ontario uh, versus Lake Michigan here sim for that in, under that bullet simply because it's very interesting, I think, that we see the patterns that we see in, with, with Pisivory in Lake Michigan, and those aren't reflected in Lake Ontario with the same species of fish under what I would consider to be similar ecological conditions in terms of lake productivity and forage fish availability. So um, just interesting things to think about moving forward. Um, and so with that, I think that's that's all I have. I'll take any questions or Jory and I can try to answer any questions. Very good presentation. Um, both of you, Jory and um, Ben, really appreciate it. Nice graphics. I was trying not to dance because I had my camera on there at the very end. Um, I see we already have a lot of questions emerging, uh, hands being raised. Um, and I think I'll hold my question until maybe a few others get a chance. I would just say one other thing is that we do have a study that was funded by GLRI to look at uh, a, diff a different type of isotope, amino acid specific that uh, Jake van der Zanden is working on. And then it does include comparisons also to Lake Superior um, and Lake Huron, Cisco. So I think you're right, Ben, in terms of that cross-lake comparison. And the fact that we're not seeing this in Lake Ontario is very interesting and somewhat surprising. So, But we are also trying to get a sort of a basin-wide look at the trophic structure of these animals. But Really nice job. Let's uh, start with Andrew Muir. Uh, thanks, Bo. Um, appreciate the talk. That was really well done, Jory and, and Ben. A uh, question about the distribution. Uh, I quickly saw your uh, slide that showed the size range and the, the larger node you have is centered around like four or 500 millimeters. There was a smaller node around uh, 300 millimeters, but that's still huge for a Cisco. Uh, I'm wondering if you have smaller animals or ages on these animals, because um, I'm wondering what you show is to me is for really, really big fish. And so it's not totally shocking that they're eating large prey items. I'm wondering if you have any sense for what the smaller individuals are doing, or if you have fish that are you know, between sort of 100 and 400 millimeters and what they're feeding on, because this could potentially reflect um, ontogenetic shifts if they reach a certain size threshold, they're moving on to larger prey. Uh, so kind of that question, but also do you have ages on these, these fish? 
So Andrew, we do have ages and that is one of the things we're working on, you know, with the tribal groups and other collaborators is to try to pull that together and put it in a more comprehensive model. But um, I think the more germane, the more important question is what are the small fish eating and where are the small fish? So we do not see a lot of small fish under 300 millimeters and that's not for lack of trying. Um, when we do get them, we treat them like gold and we do try to understand what's going on. And there, as you can imagine, and I'm sure it's going on in your mind, there, there's all kinds of hypotheses that I start thinking about, like, what is the gateway drug to piscivory? You know, how, how are they making this jump? I suspect that these are growth rates we've never experienced for this species before. And, um, and yeah, there's lots of uncertainty with those, with those smaller fish. They're hard to find. We do find some, not large numbers. And um, Little Traverse right now, um, they have some in a freezer and I've got a few in a freezer from some shoreline sampling we were doing. I need to get genetic confirmation that they are actually Cisco and not bloater. Um, and then we'll start taking them more seriously and trying to understand what's going on um, that they're jumping this fast. And, you know, I think that these are, um, are younger fish, like those, when, once they get on piscivory, their growth rates just jump and, you know, that they hit 300 pretty quickly. We did, we did collect some smaller fish this spring that we're still waiting on, on genetic, genetic results to, to confirm that they're, they're Cisco too. And once we have that confirmation, then we can Little Travers has a bunch in their freezer as well right now. So we're so all trying to find yeah. them. When you say little, can you give us like a size range, Ben and Jory? They're about 100. Okay. 150, 100. And, and are you all working on, like, I think you have some ages for some of these fish, right? We Is do have ages, yes. Up? Yeah. So like, how old? I mean, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, but how old is the yeah, <laughs> That's tough off the top of my head. But um, yeah, I mean, they are- um, Three years old, four years it old? It coincides with that 2011, you know, emergence kind mm -hmm. of thing. So they're not much older than that. Um, but I think from age one, two to three, you're getting a pretty good um, jump yeah. in size. And that's one of the reasons we don't see a lot of small fish. It's, it's a hypothesis I have. Um, that they're quickly getting up into those sizes with piscivory, um, again, without the large, without the small fish to track and get ages off of, it's hard. Yeah, right. Okay, let's go to Dave Fielder. Um, really good presentation, uh, Jory and Ben. Really interesting stuff, and in the you know the video is <laughs> really cool. Um, I had to step out from it, so maybe you've addressed this and I missed it, but I'm trying to think about the degree to which piscivory is a preferred strategy for them, or is that something that they are being reduced to because their preferred prey is unavailable? And I'm thinking specifically about macroinvertebrates like diapariya, mysis, which are greatly reduced or virtually gone from much of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Could that be their preferred prey and we're and they don't have it? So then they've got this difficult choice. Do we do I try to just eat zooplankton or do I become piscivorous? So is this another way to ask that? Is this a relatively new phenomenon or has this been maybe going on for a long time? So <clears throat> I, I think two things there, Dave, and then I'll let Ben pipe in. Um we certainly know that this didn't occur much before 2011, right? Because there just weren't a lot of fish out there. So that's, yes, it's relatively new considering that. Um, but the choice to become piscivorous, that's the million dollar question. And I mean, is it a fallback position or is it something in the systems change that has facilitated the ability to do this? Um, you know, I think the answer is somewhere in between the two, right? Because we know we're at severely reduced zooplankton abundances and, and as you mentioned, diapariya and other things that would, would be there that might sustain them in that invertebrate realm are, are not at the abundance that they were. But maybe there's some benefit in, in being piscivorous when you have a high degree of young alewife out there. Um, 
I don't, Ben, I'll let you kind of go from there because I suspect that's where you were headed. No, I, I mean, I, I think that's that's exactly it. I, you know, I, I tried to make a real specific point about that, you know, that, you know, these are, these appear to be the, the you know, the trophic ecology of these fish under current ecological conditions, but I have no idea, you know, under different conditions, what, what this would look like. And I think that's really important to, to keep that context in mind when you're looking at these results. So in, it, it certainly seems with other piscivores that when there's small alewives around, that's, that's what gets eaten. Um, and so maybe Cisco are the same way. And if there weren't small alewives, they would, they would opt for invertebrates or maybe it's like you say, and it's, it's invertebrates that are preferred. And in the absence of those, they're just taking advantage of this other, this other prey resource. But I, I mean, I would be I'm completely speculating. I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just thinking about historically in the old Lake Michigan food web, I'm not sure there was a as pelagic as a piscivore as what we have now with the Pacific salmon. I mean, lake trout, as you said, Ben, are much more benthic. <clears throat> and so maybe there's more predatory pressure than there was historically for these animals to grow more quickly. And um, and then you think about, well, what what were, what sort of, obviously before alewife, what sort of small pelagic fish would there have been for Cisco to consume? Um, I'm not sure, but I do think some of the deep water Cisco's are more pelagic oriented, you know, as age zeros at least, maybe as age one. So they may have been there for them to be more piscivorous. Um, so I think that gets to some of the questions, maybe going to some that we have um, quickly online. Titus says, if I had a box full of Cisco from the 1920s with the size of the fish, how, how did the size of these fish compare to um, what you showed in the contemporary times for Michigan and Ontario, or even Lake Superior or, or Huron? You want to address that quickly? I don't really know the answer to that. I know Chuck Bronte put in the chat shortly after that, that in Lake Superior old days, Cisco were four to the pound or less than 12 inches. I think of the work that, uh, that you all did at USGS, Bo, where you were looking at some of the historic records. I don't really have that at my fingertips. I don't know what sizes you were, <laughs> you were measuring in there, but um, I don't know if anybody else in the room here has, has info on what historic sizes were in Lake Michigan. I just Three. pulled up some data from Smith and I think Ellen Finnett, yeah, on those was like 356, something like that. Yeah. So very small. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I went to some of Yuchun's, Yuchun's data are all publicly released. Mm -hmm. So we would, should be able to get at that pretty easily, but they, they weren't summarized at least in the 2020 paper and in, in figures that I could quickly pull, but I don't think they were anywhere near like this mode of 500 millimeters that we're looking at. So, yeah. um, so Chuck, you had the next question there and I see you have your hand raised. Why don't you go next? Well, I, I would just want to offer the observation. It seems like, <clears throat> you know, when I, when I first heard about the piscivory um, by these large Cisco, I thought maybe, you know, this was related to densities of round goby which historically were not a, a food subsidy available especially at their densities and reproductive rates and now it looks like alewife are are in the mix as well um but you know thinking about you know uh, some of the comments tom todd made at the grand uh uh at the grand um uh what is it the the meeting we went to in in Michigan there in Grand Rapids uh, you know he made the note when re referencing uh the stable isotope information in the Schmidt et al studies um that this thing about piscivory was observed historically mm -hmm. not only by Cisco but by deep water some deep water Cisco's as well and that, and he was basically saying, be careful on how you interpret the the stable isotope information from the historical samples, because those were big fish, 
and they mm -hmm. likely were piscivorous. So I just think about the, the mouth gap required to ingest a small fish. Now, my question to, to uh, Jory and, and Ben is, how, how big are the fish that you're finding in the stomachs? I saw some pictures. They look fairly sizable. Were they we like that? Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm just saying, you know, you got to have a, at one point, you got to have a big enough mouth to ingest these things. Ben, so, I'm going to steal the screen, or do you have it? So I, think I, I think I have it. Let me just. Uh, 43. Yeah. No, no, next one. 43. One. Go to the bottom. Oh, there, there you go. go. So, this is the diet items. Okay. And you have round goby on top and alewife on the yeah. bottom, and then you yeah. have observed and then reconstituted based on vertebrae. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, just think of a hundred millimeter fish that, that I mean, you got to have a big, a big enough mouth to and consume that. So it doesn't surprise me that these fish that are 500 millimeters are able to consume things like that. So, so size seems to be the, the to me, the key. Um, and it was observed historically, not only in our TD, but other, other animals. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, interesting stuff, though. Good, very, very nice presentation. Um, I guess that's all. All the comments I had. Thank you. Thanks. Thank so you, much. Chuck. And that, you're right. Like I've seen it in the Lake Superior. It, the tough thing is identifying which species you're dealing with because you know that was all kind of just a gray quagmire. Um, but I, I did notice the the observations of Pisivory. So like, we know they have the capacity, right? I, I, it's um, to what extent and in what environmental situations does this does this happen in? And we've got this really, I think special. I don't know if special is the word for it. Different thing going on in Lake Michigan right now that I think is provides an opportunity to try to understand that. All right, let's work through a few more of the uh, questions in the meeting chat. So Ed Blissick shared a photograph of some Cisco stomach contents in one of the uh, Drowned River Mouth Lakes, Portage Lake, and, <clears throat> and then Ralph Tingley sort of weighed in that um, they saw similar things in Lake Charlevoix. Any comments on sort of the, the, the Drowned River? Well, you spoke, I guess, a little bit in the end then there, then towards the Drowned River Mouth next steps. Anything else to add for those comments? I would add, oh, sorry, Ben, do you want to go? No, go ahead. I would add that we get lots of angler reports about Cisco being packed full of alewife during those winter months. And I, I went out of my way to point out that that's a black hole in our diet study. And now Ralph's study and some other things, really Ralph's study, um, we're focusing more on that winter period and understanding the role of alewife and drowned river mouths and, and supplementing diets through those months that are the black box right now. Um, so there is there is alignment in these different observations and the phone calls we get. Ben, did you want to add to that? Sorry for jumping in there. Nope, that's it. Okay. Uh, Charlie Roswell's asking, um, might be kind of a hard question for you all to do off the fly. If a Cisco ate 100 grams of alewife and 100 grams of goby, would their isotope signature be right in the middle? Or would it depend on the conversion efficiency of each prey source? Um, ben, if you wanted to tackle that one. <clears throat> yeah, I think I think it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna depend on on that conversion efficiency to some extent. Um, but we see pretty pretty with these stable isotopes uh, for a lot of these species. It it seems as though. The assumptions that we make about that trophic transfer, you know, the 3.4 per mil with respect to nitrogen and the 0.4 per mil with respect to carbon, they hold up well for, for things like alewife and Chinook salmon. Um, so those are like published values from, from Jake Van de Zand and I think, you know, back in the early 2000s. And they work well with, with species that we know are pretty obligate alewife predators. Um, so I don't, have a good reason to think that it shouldn't hold up well for um for round goby in those predators as well but i mean there are assumptions inherent in that and 
and to some extent, I try to incorporate that when I'm, I, when I run the mixing models, I'm incorporating variability in our assumptions about that trophic discrimination factor um, into the Bayesian mixing model. So there's added variability corresponding to those sort of unknown values. Okay. And you have a recent paper on some of this isotopic work that just came out, is that right? This, uh, the Cisco stuff is in, it's in prep. It has been for a little while. I just need to spend more time with it. But the, uh, um, the, the salmon stuff has been published. Okay. So what I presented on the Salmonians is published. The <clears throat> Cisco stuff is soon to be published. Okay. Jory, anything to add to that question from Charlie? Absolutely not. This is Ben's wheelhouse. <laughs> okay. uh, Wendy Stott. Hi, Wendy. Any plans to compare these patterns to what is seen in some Lake Whitefish populations in Lake Huron or Michigan, probably? And so I would say that Isabora. not directly, um, but I would say that we do have um, the, oh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the tracking um, programs going on for both species, and we're noting differences in their distribution and habitat occupancy that indicate that they're very different. Like their behaviors are so different that you would expect their foraging ecology to be quite a bit different too. And um, so, I don't know, the acoustic telemetry work was the word that was not coming into my mind. Um, and there's some extensive studies going on right now where we are contrasting the two species and, and they're pretty remarkable in how different they are. Um, Cisco are covering a lot more territory than whitefish are. And hmm. So, um, Ben, did you want to add any? I, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I have stable isotope results for Lake Whitefish in, in different regions of Lake Michigan, and they, they always fall out much different than than the Salmonians. I guess I haven't compared whitefish directly to to Cisco, but I certainly have compared them to other Salmonians and they're they're different and, and very different spatially from from one another. So even within the lake, we see what lake whitefish are varied depending on the location that they were collected. It seems like benthivory or planktivory almost um, become of variable importance depending on where they're collected in the lake. Um, whereas Cisco seemed to be more, at least where we, the, the spatial extent of the samples that we have seem to be more ubiquitous. There's not, there doesn't appear to be major regional differences or port specific differences. Okay. Um, Colin Bean, is there a possible relationship between the increase in A and ALI age one? So that plot you showed then, is it correlated with the potential increase in the importance of round goby in the Cisco diet? Increase with the increase in the importance. I'm not sure I fully understand that question. That I, I yeah, I'm, I guess I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly what's being asked, but I think. Certainly, the the increase in availability of alewives. I, it wouldn't surprise me if it resulted in changes in reliance on um, round goby. I think in general, round goby have probably been a more stable prey source in Lake Michigan. Um, but when the opportunity presents itself, I think that they probably prefer alewives. So as alewife abundance increases, the sort of subsidy of goby in diets is likely to decrease. But I'm, again, I'm speculating because all I really know is under current ecological conditions. It's interesting because I was going to just add in there, Jory, in the breaker study that you sort of led, it was goby more than alewife. But of course, that could have been biased by a lot of spring. I think samples. it's a seasonal thing. Yeah. yeah. We just happen to be on the, the hot goby time. Same with diptera, really. Yeah. And so Ben's complementary data that's supposedly, you know, it's going to show up over a broader time yeah. period. It rounds the out life. the story. Yeah. Um, and then the second part of the question there, is there any difference in the geometric morphometrics of head shape between piscivorous specialists and those that feed predominantly on other prey types? 
So I'm going to answer that in, in multiple ways here. Um, one, there is a considerable amount of work going on with the geometric morphometrics, and I'm, uh, I'm going to Jason Smith and Catherine Skubik are leading a lot of that effort. Um, she um, was doing her thesis on this work. Um, and they did a considerable amount of looking at um, changes with size, um, how growth impacts those measurements. And so it's been very difficult to come out with a way to equate for growth um, and those impacts on the morphometric characteristics. But I'm also going to answer that by saying we've only re recently realized that there are stomachs that are mostly fish and mostly invertebrates and that they don't tend to mix a lot. So to call them a specialist is something that's kind of new. And even taking that data that I showed you and saying that that's a specialist is a leap still. Because just because they only ate fish that day doesn't mean that they only eat fish necessarily. Although size, I think, is going to play a role in here and be evidence in favor of them primarily eating fish, but we're still kind of working that out. And, and certainly, as they explore the implications of geometric morphometrics and growth and size, um, these are things we, we may be able to tease out in the future. Catherine, if you have any insights you'd like to provide, I see you're in here. Um, but it seems early to ask that question yet. One one thing I want to point out here, maybe as if if Catherine's going to chime in, I can I can just say something real quick before she she um, adds anything. Yeah, I think if we, you know, like with the gut content stuff, we saw like this high degree of like it was all fish or all invertebrates. Um, it wasn't there wasn't much of a mixture between the two, but I think a lot of that is just because the this this the nature of gut contents. When you sample a fish that's feeding in a patch of diptera or feeding in a patch of alewives if that's what it's going to have in its stomach and so you see that that really clear separation if there were truly fish that were specializing on one thing or another we ought to have seen it in the stable isotopes in terms of like you know that that there should have been two clusters of points you know the invertebrate specialists in the in the in the more piscivorous fish but we didn't really see that so it, it kind of seems to me that most of these things are doing the same thing isotopically. And really, um, it's it's a pretty focused, like that cluster of points for the stable isotopes was very focused. It like uh with some species like brown trout or um or round goby, we see like that isotopic niche area really expand out, corresponding to more diverse diets. So one individual might focus on round goby, another might focus on alewives, and so you end up with these sort of individuals that are very different isotopically. With something like coho salmon or Chinook salmon, or in this case, Cisco, we see those really focused clusters of points because all the individuals are apparently doing something very similar. So I, I, don't, I think that that kind of answers the question. And it, at least given the data that we have, it would suggest that there's not there's not a high degree of of differences in terms of there, there are, from my perspective, there are no invertebrate versus Piscivory specialists in in the fish that we look at, and so there may be morphometric differences, but I don't not I don't think we're going to be able to see those that specialization. Catherine, want to add anything? If she's on, yeah, yeah. If I can hop in here, Please. yeah, hey. Um, so yeah, like Jory was saying, and, and Ben, it's kind of like a newer idea of, you know, could these fish be specializing? It, ha it hasn't been something that I've like looked at so far, um, but it could definitely be something, you know, to look at in the future, adding in diet with all of the other variables uh, to see if something pops as, you know, being potentially a driver for whatever morphometric differences we're seeing. Very good. Thank you. Um, all right. Captain Dan Mannion had a question. What are commercial fishers instructed to do with any Cisco bycatch? The answer to that depends on where Captain Dan is <laughs> so it's, and, who he, and who he's fishing for. Um, 
I, I think we lost him. He had his hand up earlier. I should have just gone to him when he had his hand up, but he may have left. Dan, are you still on? It's a jurisdictional question, so it depends on who, he, who he's with. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Christian uh, Theron is the Piscivorous fish at, located at different sites. Um, in my experience, fishing at multiple locations on Lake Superior, Cisco feed heavily on smelt in late winter. And that degree of Piscivory varies at different locations. I wonder if a full basin approach also needs to have a finer lens. <clears throat> I mean, I, I would just chime in and say, you know, kind of going back to my my previous comment, from a stable isotope standpoint, I don't see that that specialization between between, you know, pistivory versus planktivory. They, they seem to all be doing something similar, at least the samples that I have. Um, but I, I don't disagree. It would be cool to have um, a little higher spatial resolution and, and more samples across the lake and really be able to drill into that a little better. It's a good point. Okay. Um, let's see. Just get through the chats here and then we'll ask. I see Randy has his hand up. <clears throat> uh, Ed asked if you could share the links of the underwater videos in the chat. Did you already do that, Ben? No, but I can. Just give me a okay. second here. All right. Uh, Andrew, it looks like you jumped off. Um, but I think question showing that earlier slide you showed, um, Joy, about 2011 is when things really took off. And I guess he was just yeah. asking if that's the mostly what we're seeing, if it's that 2011 year class. Right. He's wondering if it's one group, even though it's multiple age groups, that that's okay. easy to answer. Okay. Um, Wendy, I had a second question. To look at choice, um, she's, she's suggesting mm -hmm. look at some of the European species where there are some, I think what she means is ontogenetic shifts at larger sizes yeah. to Piscivory. So what you mean, Wendy, if you wanted to jump on? Yeah, that is what exactly I meant. Just, you know, how does, you know, back to Dave's comment is, you know, is this being mm -hmm. driven by losses of the zooplankton or is this something that, you know, has always happened, you know, maybe comparing it to a European or even the high Arctic systems where those losses aren't as severe might be a way to get at it. And then also the, you know, the, the extreme Northern cousins to notice where that, that is a common life history pattern that they shift to eating small fish after a certain size. And then um, I just want to point this out. We've done a considerable amount of work on inland lake um, Cisco populations and uh, collected some information for morphometric analysis and, and looked at, you know, mostly for the morphometric analysis and some genetic analysis. There's one lake, Glen Lake, um, that's adjacent to Lake Michigan. And that lake had a bivergent um, length distribution where there were groups of really small fish and then there were groups of really large fish. And it would be super fascinating to get in there and find out if maybe you do have some specialists and generalists, you know, in that population. I think genetically they did not differ, um, but it might be worth going into a system like that where you have um, two different, you know, clearly different pathways going on. Um, what what's creating that situation, and and are they, you know, making the choice and for what reasons and. So there may be some situations yeah. that you could study more um, and look at that. Yeah, definitely. We see similar things in Algonquin Park where there's, mm -hmm. you know, that divergence in size and habitat use. And in some lakes, they're genetically different and other lakes, they're not. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. And it was sort of my comment about the lake whitefish was kind of along the same lines because, you know, there's a few populations that have, you know, been eating fish for, you know, and it's been observed for about 10 years and just kind of mm -hmm. is that also related to changes in the zooplankton or is it just that there's more mm -hmm. fish getting to the size where they can mm -hmm. but, but cool work it's work. fascinating okay thanks wendy um colin bean has a few more comments just 
talking about what he's seeing with Corvonians in Scotland. That's really interesting. And he wishes us Happy New Year from Scotland, but he had to jump off. Um, Ralph had some more. Ralph, did you want to jump on and just talk a little bit more about the diets that you've seen from Muskegon so far? Yeah, sure. Um, I was just pointing out that, you know, we, we talked a bit about Lake Charlevoix, where we processed 25 fish and 20 of them had had fish and they were all ale life, 100% ale life. Um, and we saw similar in the number of diets we've processed so far at Portage Lake, um, where ale life was the only species. But when we got down to Muskegon Lake, uh, where we've been seeing Cisco in the last few years um, with the help of Steve Pothoven and, and Jeff Elliott and then Ben Leonard uh, dissecting those fish, we saw a more variable diet. Um, now it's a small sample size. We only have seven fish that had anything in their guts, but we saw brook silver sides and identified shiner species as well as ale life. So um, we're hoping if we were able to get out on the ice this year um, to get add to that data set and see about that more variable diet. Thanks. We didn't want to steal your thunder, Ralph, so we didn't go too far into that. Thanks for sure. <laughs> no, I can steal away. It's a it's a joint effort. So. And then I think our last from the, unless I missed uh, something from the chat, is uh, Weidel just providing a little bit of anecdotal information about a few instances of Pisivory. Uh, BW, did you want to jump on and add anything more to that? No, just that we likely missed some fish and our fish aren't very big, so. Yeah, the size again, okay. All right, thanks for your patience, Randy. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> you know, in some uh, societies, the old age gets to go first, you know, so. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I had uh, two things. First, though, just uh, it was nice to see all this uh, diet data and stable isotopes uh, together. Uh, even though I've read it, I got more, I certainly got more out of it today. So I had uh, then two uh, comments on the biology. Uh, one was, uh, I was kind of wondering why uh, the alewives tend to disappear from the diet after the summer. And then two is, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to point out that your interpretation of your results hinge entirely on your concept that the fish you're working on now are the same lineage of the Cisco of the past. So I, as you know, I've written papers on this and I'm not asking you to believe what I wrote, but uh, you are, I think you are obligated to point out the alternative theories and how it would affect your interpretations. So uh, yeah, because I mean, I, I, I think there's little, I mean, I can't imagine that what you're working on today is the same as the typical art of die of Celts. So much, that's all I need to say. George, do you want to respond to the alewife side of that? Do you want me to take a crack at that? Go ahead. Um, I, I guess I'm not terribly sure why why the alewives weren't present in those in those fall samples. That most of that fall sampling, I believe, came from um from spawning surveys, right, Jory? Correct. And so, yeah, whether they're eating yeah. or not would be would be a concern. But I'm also thinking that it, it's your argument earlier about um, prey abundance and opportunism. And yeah. so bithotrephes were playing a large role in those fall diets. Um, and I think it's because there are just a lot of them and you, you're gonna take what, what's easy, right? Yeah, yeah. And so then the other part of it is that so it was it was restricted to like these shallow sort of spawning waters, I think, where most of the collections were happening, um, probably near Elk Rapids. I think most of those were from Grand Traverse Bay, right? Maybe even yes. East Grand Traverse Bay. Yeah. So given given sort of the spatial uh, distribution of where most of those samples came from, I would guess that's probably why we didn't see many ill wives in in diets at that time. Um, and then regarding the lineage. I, I, yeah, I don't disagree with you. They, they probably are different than what they were before, but I guess I don't know enough about that to really 
comment on how those different lineages um, would behave under current ecological conditions or how this lineage would behave under past ecological conditions. So I'm not sure I can really say much about that, but um, but yeah, point taken. Okay. And Randy, you're just saying that morphologically they're different than than the way that Kells described them, what he called typical Arteti, right? Well, it's morphological evidence. Uh, they're very different. This the Cisco there, what they're calling a Cisco, uh, which I believe is a species complex, not a species, you know, not a species. But once you start calling them species, this is a species. I think you get into these conceptual problems, but they're morphological differences. We just had a paper accepted. I think you were an aren't you an author on it? Uh, pretty much showing the uh, historical form uh, being extirpated. So uh, when you so it makes it makes a difference in how you perceive this thing as a species or a part of a species complex, because the way I would see it, Cisco is not recovering in Lake Michigan. The inference that there's a recovery, it, this, the, uh, that form is extirpated. And this form that you're seeing now isn't recovering. It's probably more abundant now than it was in the past. And so you get very different perspective on what's going on, depending on how you see the taxonomy of these, uh, of these fish. Well, point taken, the taxonomy is definitely it's actually actively under review, and we should be hearing something from the names committee of the joint of um, ASIH and AFS. At some point, I think in 2023. Um, but I I would counter a little bit that I think we need not just morphological evidence, but a suite of genetic evidence and and, and something about their trophic ecology to to make more of a definitive statement about their taxonomy. And I know you and I disagree on that, but that's I'll just put that out there too. Um, Ed, have questions? Yeah. Is there any plans to look at a diet study in Lake Huron where we have this 10 year Cisco stocking program going on? And just curious the diets in Lake Huron. So any thoughts about looking at studying studying that in conjunction with the stocking program? Dave Fielder, any U.S. Fish and Wildlife people over from here on um, want to weigh in on that? Dave Fielder still here? Yep. I, I think they are definitely keeping stomachs from any Cisco that are caught, um, Ed. So it could be another opportunistic study, much like the one that Jory and described, and then Ben also, I think, was opportunistic. So. We did look at some diets uh, at USGS, and I want to say it's no more than like 25 Cisco's not caught. I mean, before the stocking really got going. So these would have been Cisco caught in Georgian Bay, mostly in North Channel or Northern Lake Huron. Um, we did not see any evidence of Pisivory in that really small opportunistic sample size. They were eating Bithotrephes and copepod zooplankton. So we haven't seen that. I do think there's been some anecdotal evidence if Aaron Dunlop is on maybe still. Um, I, I've seen some sort of Facebook-like evidence of goby showing up in the diets over there, which wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, but I don't know if anybody else from Lake Huron wants to add to that. It's a good, it's a good question. They're big fish. I, I know I've seen some indication of that, but I, I really don't spend time over there. Yeah, I'll just add to what Bo said. Um, as far as returns from the stocking, we really haven't had many samples um, up until this fall. This fall was the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, sampled a, you know, a large group of fish. So it's really the first look at how the stocked fish might be feeding, but it's fall sampling. So it's gonna, it's not seasonal and, and it's gonna be a while before we probably have sample sizes from Lake Huron from the stock Cisco to see what their feeding ecology is. Thanks for jumping in, Randy. Oh, okay, let's see. We have a few more questions for the chat, if you all are okay to keep going, it is two o'clock. Mm -hmm. 
You good for a few more? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Paige Werner. Oh, thanks for the interesting information. Wendy, any concerns that the alewife diet will have the similar impacts on Cisco as they did lake trout? So I think she's thinking like a thiamine ace. It's on our radar. We've certainly talked to Jacques about getting some some measurements. <clears throat> um, you know, that, that's about all I can say, um, you know, because that plays out so differently in different species complex. Um, but it's definitely on our radar like to, to be aware of it and to get some um, metrics. Okay. Uh, Vic Santucci. So it's going back to that, why my alewives disappear in the fall. He's asking, could those young of your alewife actually outgrow the, the, the gape of those even large Cisco by the fall? Maybe that's why they're doing that. Uh, I don't I don't think so. And I mean, I can show you why I think that is. So um, I'll go back to that that figure that Jory put in here <clears throat> here, if you guys can see this. So this is the the length distribution of of alewives that were observed in in the diets of of Cisco. And what I think you see here is so a lot of our Cisco were collected in the um, in the fall. And I think that's probably this mode right here that would represent young of year fish. So like by fall, you're going to be in this, you know, I don't know, probably, well, it might be, this might be summer to fall, you know, this kind of size range for young of year fish. And then, then we have a bunch of samples that were collected in the spring where there's no young of year alewives anymore. Now you're looking at yearling alewives and they're probably going to be closer to this size range or maybe even a little larger, but it seems like for the most part, those I, I think they would be able to consume young of year fish um, into the fall, and it wouldn't be until the following year's yearlings that they might outgrow some kind of gape limitation. And I mean, even in like that that video that I was showing, those those Cisco in the Charlevoix um, channel right there, those that was in the that was in the springtime, and those were those were yearling fish mostly in those schools, mm -hmm. and they were doing work on them. Good, very helpful. All right, any final questions for Jory or Ben? All right, well, again, um, awesome presentation as indicated by, I think the record high turnout that we had here. I think I saw it hit 120, which is fantastic. Thanks to everyone that uh, joined and has stayed on here till the end uh, for a great discussion. Um, February 3rd, I believe, is our next uh, webinar, and Renee dropped the um, registration there in the chat. And um, for those that stayed on, just uh, please give a virtual round of applause if you can, if you can navigate the, um, the Zoom there, just for a great presentation by Jory and Ben. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you next month. <clears throat>